right. Hello, YouTubers. Um, we have uh, folks joining us today from multiple different places. We have uh, folks joining us from Instagram, people from Facebook. Um, and so I've encouraged them to join us over here. It's just a little bit more interactive experience for them. It'll allow them to just be able to engage with us. You know, as you know, I can host questions here and things like that. So it just makes it a little bit more organized for me to be able to kind of start this dialogue. So again, I, I invite people who are on Instagram, who are on Facebook, that want to uh, participate in this conversation to definitely go and watch it over on YouTube, just a better experience all around. I uh, hope everybody is doing great. It is uh, Sunday for most of you, <laughs> um, and I just wanted to, to wish everybody, I uh, hope they had a happy weekend and uh, you kind of made the, made the best of the extra time that you might have on your hands right now since we're all uh, primarily uh, trapped indoors uh, for, for the foreseeable future. So the intent in uh, doing these, these videos and, and with a little bit more regularity than, than normal is really about giving you as many enrichment tools and opportunities that, that you can take advantage of where you, where you maybe have a little bit more time in your hands than usual. Um, and so I'm going to try to offer you as many uh, cheap and easy DIY things. If you've been watching the channel at all throughout the, the last few weeks, we've done a DIY interface, which a lot of you were asking about. We've also uh, done DIY um, DC power cables and just kind of using the pre-existing cables that actually come with your power supply in order to make the best use of those and make sure that they, they, that they can work in any combination that you need, whether that's multiple voltages, whether that's uh, parallel, whether that's uh, series, things like that, and so teaching you how to wire all that stuff. And this is kind of a continuation of something that I'm working on right now, which is really about how to use instrument cables. The, you know, and when I say instrument cables, the, the differentiator that I'm using is instrument cables are what would be going from your guitar into the amplifier, or it'd be going from the guitar into the pedal board, or it'd be coming out of the pedal board and going back to the amplifier. So these are kind of the longer cables that typically need to be more robust a little bit more well built than the patch cables. That would be the kind of the smaller versions that would be interconnections on your pedal board. So it would be, you know, sort of a combination of, of you know, the, the best types of instrument cables I think will work as opposed to patch cables. Today we're not going to talk about patch cables. There's those little tiny interconnectors that we have on all the connections on our pedal board. These type of cables are the kind of the bigger, thicker, more robust. And we're going to talk about where they make a difference in sound and if you're going to spend money on a cable, which one that would you'd want that, that to be, all things being equal. So I'm going to get right into it. I've listed all the cables that we're going to be using today, but let me just kind of show you a visual so you kind of know where, where we're going with it. So first one is George L's. So you may have heard me in the solderless videos talk about how unreliable George L's are, and I still stand by that. However, Using them as an instrument cable and actually soldering the ends, you can see here that I soldered a uh, Switchcraft silent uh, plug and then just a normal Switchcraft plug on the on the opposing end. Uh, and this is actually something Eric Johnson does on his on his input cable. And so I kind of copied what he's got going on. So I've actually soldered one of these, and so we can kind of hear what this actually does. And in in soldering this makes it takes away the reliability issue. So you're really just you know, getting to hear it and what it does. And, and we'll talk about why I like this for certain things and where you might consider getting a George L cable and actually just soldering it yourself just to make it more reliable like I did here. Um, we're going to be, I got some evidence um, cables. Now this one, I, I, I was given, it was given to me by somebody and I had to shorten it at one point because the plugs were broken. So I actually don't even know which one this is. If anybody recognizes what this is, they they told me it was evidence. I don't know. It actually sounds pretty good. So um, whatever this one is, I'm not. This is kind of the wild card one. Um, I have some Mogami. This is not 2524. I can't remember the number on this one because it's kind of worn off. But uh, this is a, actually a twisted pair shielded Mogami mic cable. And a lot of guys who are rig builders out in Europe like using this uh, twisted pair shielded. And it's a little bit different than the, than the coax that, mo that all the other ones are today. And so these can actually be directional. I'll talk about why they're directional uh, a little bit further on. Uh, and then I got, of course, one of my all-time favorites, uh, the Belden 9778. Uh, this one is, I was doing a little 
tone kind of tasting today and I was I, I always come back to this cable it sounds so good it's like really kind of punchy and has like a nice low end it's really nice and round uh, we'll talk more about that and then um, we have the uh, Canary uh, GS6 this is kind of like an equivalent to like a Mogami good nice sounding um, and then I do have a Mogami somewhere in here there it is then I have a Mogami uh, 2524. This is, you know, again, another one of my favorites. Really great. It has a little bit more of a mid-range thing going on. And um, I, think that's, I think that's everything we're going to be trying today. So, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert guitar player like some of the people that we have do on our demos. But I'll, I'll try to do my best to the extent to which it can kind of show you through what you can hear here uh, about what they do and, and kind of what I'm noticing that may not always translate to you know your iPhone or however you're receiving this, um, but I'll do my best to make that that distinction for you so that you can kind of hear what my thoughts are, and then uh, you know you can go and, and explore some of this stuff for yourself, um, you know as, as it goes. So what I'm going to be running through today when we're kind of going through these cables, I have a Fender Concert uh, Reverb, and that's kind of below the desk here, just ahead, and then that's the Paul Rivera era one. I'm just on the clean channel of that and I uh, have some reverb on from that and I have a little bit of slap um, delay coming from a, uh, a 2290 so we're gonna you know have the slap delay from the 2290 very subtle kind of ducking delay and uh, I think that that'll be that'll be kind of the the way that we'll do it so the first and, and I'll be using a strat you know so this is again is is a baseline. You know, you may still want to go if you if you think that there's something that's like an aha moment for you today. You, you would probably still want to go and, and try maybe your top two contenders if you if you have the the budget for that of the things you think might work best. But let's get right into it and just really start talking about if you got some money to spend on an instrument cable. You know, again, clarifying that that's the the cable that goes from your guitar into your pedal board or from the guitar into your amplifier. It's not the little connections in, in between your, your pedal board. You know, they, these are much thicker cables. They wouldn't be good for this application because they're just too stiff, too, too hard to maneuver. The bottom line is, is if you do have a high quality buffered rig, so you're using buffers in the way that I've talked about in a lot of our videos, you have an input and an output buffer. At the very least, have some sort of input buffer that is, is controlling your pickup loading. Ideally, the only cable that's really going to be impacted is going to be that first cable, that one leaving your instrument and going into the pedal board. Now this is presuming, of course, you're not using a wireless, right? This would negate, uh, this instrument cable would be negated by a wireless. Uh, or if you have some sort of active pickups that have a preamp inside the guitar itself. So if that's one of your conditions, then this will not apply to you. But the majority of us are you still using passive pickups, passive guitars without active um, preamps in them. So the most important cable is that cable, that very first one, because there isn't any signal conditioning happening at that point. And the composition of the cable and the sound of the cable is actually going to be most impacted at that point, because there isn't any conditioning. So whatever the guitar is, is seen at that point is going to be part of the sound. It's not going to be mitigated by the buffer that it would hit on the input of the system, or whatever pedal you turn on, or however you're, you're sort of uh, categorizing whatever your input buffer is going to be. So the main thing that you want to do is you really want to spend your time and energy to kind of figure that out, you know, to, to really figure out what the best tone is. Now every single one of your cables is going to influence the sound differently. So we talk about cables usually in terms of what's called capacitance, and that's usually the, the big word, the X factor that a lot of people talk about. They say, oh, my cable is really low capacitance. You know, and that can be a good thing, especially if, you know, your, your goal is to try to get it as neutral of a sound as possible. But the reality is, is that sometimes low capacitance will not give you the tone that you're looking for, right? So we can say, we can build a rig that's going to make it sound exactly the same as your guitar plugged into your amplifier with no capacitance in between, right? We buffer it and do all that stuff. But that actually could be a sound that you don't like. Maybe you like to have a little bit of roll off. Maybe you like to have a little bit of capacitance, right? And sort of the root word of capacitance is, is capacitor, right? It's like you change a capacitor inside of your instrument, right? If you have a, a strat like this, you know, you can, you can change the capacitors inside the, the controls and that can actually have a, a big impact 
on the way that the instrument sounds. You know, if you don't use a, a 0 0.022 or whatever it is that you choose, these can all have a, make a difference in the way that it sounds. And, and the cables, with their capacitance, it's basically like a filter for the entire rig. And that first cable is going to be that, that kind of pre-pedal board filter that's going to actually filter the sound for everything that's going to be coming after it. And so if you're going to spend big money on cables, that one that you want to invest in is going to be that first, in, that very first one that comes into the rig. After that, if you've conditioned the signal, you've buffered like I've recommended, you can get away with a, a less, or you can get away with a lesser cable, or at least one that that is not, you know, it's it's going to be less impacted by the type of cable that it is. Once you've buffered it, there's going to it's going to kind of act as a firewall in a way for those cables that come after it. But that very first cable that's going into the rig. That's going to be the one where you really want to spend your money. That that's really going to make a difference. Uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, Lost Smoke though here because he did give a five dollar super chat. I, I supremely appreciate that, and uh, and and I will do my best here to keep that up with the, as much knowledge as I can as I can present. So thank you for that. So I want to take you through the first one that we talked about, which was the George L. Now this one we know guys like Eric Johnson are huge fans of George Ls, and on his rig, you know, some of these are soldered, some of them are not. But the instrument cable that goes, you know, into the rig is always soldered. And I presume that the reason is, is that he's plugging in and out so much, it just didn't make sense to have this be solderless. But my thought on the George L is it's actually pretty bright. But it can be really good sometimes if you have a lot of older vintage effects. It can be a kind of a darker, it can have this darker impact on the overall tone. So this can almost be like a way that you compensate for what's happening on the rig, where it's kind of dark, you have a lot of old vintage stuff, it's got some noise. They can kind of be a little bit muddy sounding. And I could see why guys, especially in the early days, like George L was really like the first real boutique cable company, you know, back, I think that they were, were out as in, the, in their early 80s or maybe in the late 70s. Uh, and guys were really into these because this was like their first boutique cable that was out there and it was available for consumers to be able to manipulate themselves with solderless cables. So I'm just going to give you a little taste of kind of like what this thing does. Um, and so you can kind of hear for yourself what the what the tone is. So I'm going to put on the headphones here only because the uh, the concert has a ISO cab that's in one of the other rooms, so I won't be able to hear what it does unless I have on the uh, headphones. So this is the this is the uh, the Giorgio. So I mean, I, it's hard because we're not hearing a bass line here of, of what <laughs> what it would sound like with any other cable. So we're kind of just going to have to compare as we go. But the thing I'm, I hear kind of versus, let's just say, Mogami, which is what I use most, most uh, normally, it definitely has like a high-end presence. Like, a, like the 2K to 5K is really pronounced. So if I can see why guys like Eric Johnson like it for that. that kind of like really bright uh, kind of ethereal thing the kind of Alan Holdsworth thing so it, it definitely does great for that sort of stuff it can it's pretty stratty has that kind of you know, that kind of classic, almost like Buddy Holly-ish vibe to it. Uh, you know, where, where the it's the strat sounds like really, really kind of bitey. Um, and I and I can see where it works really well for that. I don't like it so much for distortion because I actually find it gets kind of peaky. And just by the way, as an aside here for anybody who's on uh, Facebook or Instagram, they're just hearing like acoustic string ringing right now. They're not getting to hear any any other stuff. So I'm, I'm sorry to those people. You should definitely come and join us on YouTube if you actually want to hear what this sounds like. Um, so I, I definitely think that it's, it's, a, it's, it's definitely a, a brighter kind of cave. But it's good for that ethereal kind of...
minor stratty tremolo thing, you know, guys like again, I can understand why Eric Johnson is into that. I can get that. But, you know, for a lot of guys that are using distortion, I could see I could see where this this wouldn't work for them. You know, like it, it could it could get peaky if you hit it too hard, and that's kind of been my experience with George Ells, is like clean strat stuff sounds incredible. Um, but when you start getting into like, you know, higher gain stuff, it, that that two to five K exaggeration is already really exaggerated in those uh, in those amplifiers. So it can be really uh, in a lot of those like high gain, like JCM 800, Soldano, stuff like that. They already have this really, uh, you know, high, like kind of upper mid range, trebly kind of distortion. And so when you exaggerate that with the cable, it kind of, it, it sort of works against you. Now, um, <laughs> I think that uh, Red's saying those acoustic strings sound great on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, they do. Uh, you know, it's it, the acoustic Strat is, is one of the most underrated acoustic guitars, I will say that. Um, but one of them that I think is actually sort of like, I kind of consider like the antithesis to George L, um, which I actually didn't mention in the intro, is a, is a Swiss company called Gotham. And it's it, it, it kind of... It does some of the same frequencies that George Ells do, but it has this airiness that I don't know. Like, there's almost like this airiness that, that that's like built into it, where you can feel like this this like the notes kind of float a little bit more, and they don't quite have kind of have that same pierce. Um, so I'm gonna kind of like compare that for you. Let me let me unplug. You're gonna hear a little pop for a second, and let's see what happens when we plug in the Gotham cables. I should really like build like an eight an eight way like AB box for cables so we can just like hear them all in real time, but uh, I didn't have the foresight for that. Yeah, all right. Sorry if there was a loud hum there <laughs> or pop. So uh, here's here's the Gotham, and I, I really like the the kind of Swiss. This Swiss company, they, they do a really, really great job of, the cable's super robust made. You can kind of hear, or at least I'm hearing, that there's not that really piercing high, but but it, it still, it still kind of has a nice sheen to it. more of that airiness built in so like I, I feel like if you like the George L thing but you want it to kind of just have a little more space in that high end where you don't feel like it's just ice picking you I think the Gotham man is is the move it, it really has like a and it sounds better to me with gain <laughs> So that's the, the strat thing. So it's not like you lost your instrument. It, it, it had so much mid-range that like overtook kind of the beautiful scoopness of your strat. So that was um, that was pretty 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 cool sounding. Um, let's uh, let's kind of go into to one of my favorites now. Kind of like the the baseline that I use kind of for everything, which is the the Mogami Twenty Five. 24 and I, I love these silent plugs by the way there you know there's obviously a couple different brands but switchcraft and neutrick are kind of my two favorite if you're going to go silent with these guys of course I always want to wrap up your cables nicely i've seen some really bizarre cable wrapping techniques lately so i just want to demonstrate one for you let's go to the mogami So 
So Mogami, I find they have the most mid-range. And I think that that can sometimes be a frequency that pedal boards struggle with, especially when they're not buffered real well. Uh, that's another thing I should mention about George L's that a lot of people like them because they have so much high end that when you're not buffering, it can have the perception as though you didn't lose a bunch of your, your, your kind of like two to five K plus from those. And so a lot of people, when they would change their pedal ports from like, uh, you know, Gepco to, you know, whatever fill in the blank, they, you know, they, they, they changed to, or they changed from uh, horizon or whatever. And they went to, to um, George L and they're like, Oh, my high end's back. It's, my problems are solved. You know, but as soon as you put a buffer in there, then they sound so bright. They're like unusable. So there's kind of a trick that I think a lot of cable manufacturers were doing for a while where they were putting all this high-end exaggeration in the cable and it was compensating for the fact that people weren't using buffers or good quality ones. But if you have a good quality buffer, you know, you have to be careful, especially with using those sorts of interconnectors like, uh, you know, they have a lot of high-end like the George L stuff. But here's Mogami. I think that this is one of my favorites. <laughs> So I mean, this one has got already. You can hear it's got it's got a lot more. I always thought that this was like the most balanced cable. It sounded great with distortion. It sounded great, clean. If you. Stuff, really great for rock stuff. I mean, obviously we're playing clean right now just because uh, sometimes if I get really loud <laughs> with gain, uh, our neighbors will feel the vibrations. Like even though you can't hear like any high end, you just feel like this like rumble. And so I want to just be uh, aware that it's you know it's like dinner time for most people here. Mogami, you know, for the money, it's super unbeatable. I mean, you can get, you can get this Mogami 2524 in bulk for less than a dollar a foot. There was a company for a while that I was buying them from that was making assembled Mogami cables with these ends on them, the silent end already on them, and they were like 25 bucks on uh, eBay, and I couldn't believe that they actually like could make them for that because to buy a 10 foot cable, you're looking around 10 dollars and just the cable. And then those Neutrik ends are like 10 bucks each almost, especially the silent ones. So they were basically making them almost at cost. I have no idea how they're making money. And they were called Rainwater Sound. So look those guys up on eBay. If you can find them still, it was unbelievable how cheap they were. And I would just buy like, if they had eight available, I'd just buy all eight. Because uh, they were really, really inexpensive. I'll see if I can find them when the video is over and, and, and uh, see if we can get them linked for you guys. But Rainwater Sound was the name. And I think they were somewhere in the Atlanta Georgia area, but I would say for, for the money, you can't beat the, the Mogami, that, that mid-range. Just kind of works great with a strut. definitely say Mogami all things being equal even though George Hills can be great if you need to exaggerate that high end you got some old vintage stuff that's really dark and you kind of want to give it a little boost in the front I think that's really good to kind of filter it that way and then it, you know if you like the George L but you don't want quite that that pierce uh, kind of piercingness in the high end the Gotham from in Switzerland is great kind of like utility cable though Mogami is so hard to beat so hard to beat on that it's just so damn good um, let's try the uh, the evidence one and see how that sounds now this one i will uh i will say if, if you do hear it a little bit duller than the others it, this is longer than 10 feet whereas the first guys i've done have been all 10 feet i think this is more like 12 
but uh, my understanding on a lot of the evidence stuff is it's, it's really, really low capacitance and it definitely feels solid core. Um, so it's pretty, pretty stiff. Let's see. Which it sounds pretty dark. Are people hearing that as being darker? I don't know how it actually is proceeding on the YouTube end. I'm in on that bridge pickup right now too. Yeah, I mean this wouldn't be the <laughs> this wouldn't be the 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 the, the Stratius one. Kind of a darker one is when I, is when I'm hearing. I don't know. You tell me in the comments if you feel like you're you're hearing a, a darker. But yeah, and, and that can be good too. Like if you got a lot of really bright stuff in your single chain, or you've got a, a system with all George L's or something like that, or or the Evidence Audio SIS is pretty bright sounding uh, to me. Not the same way that the George L's is, is a little more balanced. But you needed to kind of take off a little of that, attenuate a little bit of that. You could use something like this to to kind of help mellow it out a little bit. I can see the advantage there. It doesn't sound unbalanced, though. You know, somebody's saying there's no guitar sound on IG. Yeah, there's not. We did a preamble at the beginning, so it's just going to sound like acoustic guitar at this point on Instagram. So you have to join us over on YouTube if you actually want to hear this stuff. So just a, a heads up there. But, you know, again, application for everything, right? It's like you could have a system where this just wouldn't really work because, or that this would be great if it was really bright cables. You, you know, needed to kind of tame some highs down. You didn't want to go with a coily cable to do that, which is another alternative, right? If you have like a really bright amp or you just want to trim some highs off, those coily cables basically doubles whatever you have. So if you've got a 10-foot cable that's coiled, it's really like a 20-foot cable at that point. I haven't messed around with this one much, but I'm kind of curious because I saw like a lot of guys like rig builders like uh, Steen Skrydstrup uh, in Sweden. He uses this type of cable and it's twisted pair shielded. So let me just let me do a little talk about twisted pair shielded and directional cables for all the uh, high futility folks out there. Um, so is there such thing as directional cables? There are such things as directional cables. However, the benefit of a directional cable is, is only that it shields better in one direction. Sonically, there really shouldn't be any difference if you plug it in one way versus the other way. Only that it would shield better in that one position. So basically what you're doing is on the output side, the one that's plugged into the guitar, you're going to connect the shield and you're gonna connect one of the center conductors. So there's the twisted pair shielded, basically looks like a mic cable. So you have two center conductors, and then you have a shield that's wrapped around those center conductors. So on the guitar side, you just dedicate one of those center conductors as part of the shield. You wrap it around together, and you solder that to the ground, right? So that's on here, that's soldered to the ground. So that center conductor and the shield soldered to the ground. And then the center conductor is soldered to the hot. On this side, however, you cut the shield completely away. You're not gonna use it at all. And that center conductor, that one of those two conductors that you dedicated to the shield, on the other side, you're just gonna to wire to the ground by itself here, and then the center conductor is still gonna be the center conductor the same way that it is on the other side. And then you just need to make sure that the side where you've connected the shield is the side where you plug in the guitar. And so to the extent with which it shields better, it is directional. But as far as the sound, it's not going to sound that much different. It might just be noisier in one direction. So let's see 
what these uh, Swedish rig builders are talking about with this guy. I kind of don't know what to expect, you know, on uh, on some of this stuff. Let's see if, how we kind of think it, it pairs up. All right. Yeah, and this is a Mogami, by the way. I forget the model number, but... Maybe a little bit brighter than the last one, but it's actually kind of on the dark side, I would say. definitely would say that it, it it's still kind of on the darker side. I don't know. What, do you, what are you guys hearing on that end? I don't know if it's feeling like it's, it's really dark. It doesn't feel as dark as the last one to me. a little darker and maybe not as dark as that uh, evidence one or what what we think is evidence what I was told was evidence when it was given to me Mike Saney hears clear amids yeah that might be true thing for sure yeah I get the I get the mids thing here it's it's not quite as mid-range forward as the 2524 it's so it's a little bit more scoop than that which could be a good thing like if you wanted to kind of have more of that uh, stratty scoop thing like when I was kind of you know uh, disgracing Mark Knopfler it kind of does have a little bit of that that kind of quacking is. Uh, you can still do that kind of quackiness thing, whereas I feel like the other one kind of didn't didn't have enough snap to kind of get it. Yeah, I get that. Um, so yeah, I think that this is kind of like an intermediary. It's sort of like if you didn't want to go full mid range of twenty five, twenty four Mogami. This would kind of be like a step back from that, but I think it still has a pretty balanced EQ uh, overall. So definitely not mad at this cable at all. And, they, and they, the cool thing about it is that it's made in a lot of different colors. So if you were gonna say, set up your whole system this way, you wanted to dedicate one cable for like a send and return of your effects loop, or you had a stereo system and you wanted to dedicate one to right and one to left, you could easily do that. I think it comes in like five or six different colors, which is pretty cool. Um, and is everybody good with uh, with uh, my explanation of twisted pair shielded? Because that's a little bit it's a little bit complicated. I can show a diagram if anybody needs that uh, in the future for how to wire twisted pair shielded. Loosely sponsored by Lacroix today. Um, let's take a look at uh, Canari, Japanese made. Uh, I just made this one again the other day. Now, 
another sort of preface for this guy, this is 12 feet as well. So it's a couple feet longer than everything else we've been trying. So just uh, keep that in mind. This was given to me by the same person that gave me the evidence <laughs> table. So uh, thank you to Brandon Stone. All right, let's see how this guy compares. Oh, okay, this is I like I like how this one sounds. This is a little more, it's a little closer than Mogami. I'm thinking that this definitely sounds kind of closer than Mogami mid-range wise. A little less low end maybe. to me sounds definitely like kind of like more like the 2524 maybe a little less bass but the high end is also not too overpowered wondering what you guys are hearing what are you hearing here kind of compared quacky factors there what that song is <laughs> um, I definitely think that yeah if you have headphones on you'll be able to hear this because it is recorded with a 57 on um, I have a 412 Marshall cab in the uh, in one of the other rooms and it's just got a 57 on four different speakers so right now we're, we're listening to a, a G1265 mic'd with a, uh, a 57 um, so I'm definitely hearing here definitely <laughs> It actually is, is pretty balanced still. I'd say the one thing I'd say it's lacking, like if I had to really be nitpicky about it, is the, the low end is a little bit a little bit flat for me compared to the other. But I think overall it's actually a pretty good cable. And, and sometimes, you know, if you have a really bassy amp or you're going in through a a uh, combo, uh, like a small combo, like a Princeton or something that's, that's kind of more compact. I don't think that those can sometimes produce so much bass. Sometimes you want a little bit more bass roll off than even what it can do when you bring your bass down to zero on some of those. Um, some of those. So definitely, um, that's what I'm hearing on the Canary GS6. But definitely not mad at this cable either. You know, this is it's it's sort of like the cables are, are just flavors. You know, it's like how do you want how do you want to kind of do the initial seasoning of the rig there's really not going to be something that's totally neutral um, at the point with which it comes into your rig so, so every every cable is a is a compromise in some degree but it's like how do you want to exaggerate that compromise do you want to do you want to kind of cheat it a little bit more toward the high end do you want to cheat it toward the low end do you want to cheat it toward more mid-range so this is just kind of like a uh, 
Let me start at the penny. Now, this is the cable that when I shot this stuff out earlier today, I was most impressed with. And, and I've, I've used this cable a lot over time. And, you know, I hadn't used it in a while, and I, I broke it out. This is the Belden 9778. And this was like a broadcast cable, <laughs> like for, it was coax, but it, I think it was designed for broadcast purposes. I don't even know that it was necessarily uh, a, a guitar cable first uh, idea. I'm just going to make sure I can actually plug it in here without murdering this guitar. All right, there we go. And I found it to be really fat in the low end, which is which I like. But I also found that it had like kind of this percussiveness that I really like. So let's just kind of hear um, what uh, we got going on here. It's like a snap. definitely got uh, some of that bell like thing you know more Hendrixy but the the bottom end like on this one you can really hear that there's a snap to it whereas when I when I try to go for those low notes on the canary it kind of had this dullness like this flattening effect to it which I don't like I like the bass to kind of have this like snap where you can really kind of get that uh, the meeting of the to it and you know I don't have a pick here to really dig in for the bluesy stuff or maybe I do I got a pick somewhere <laughs> find an old pick from my buddy Zapata Try it on the uh, bridge pickup. Not peaky at all there, which I really like. It, it kind of tames some of that top. It doesn't not sound stratty anymore. snaps I like how there's this compression kind of percussive element that happens with it and I also like that there is such a like a fatness to the low end like it just seems to keep it really percussive and and big so you know I think for like the utility cable Mogami is still number one in my book but this one for like what I like to go for man I think especially with strats it, you know sometimes it can be overwhelming 
uh, you know, you get too much snap on the low end. But it also just, it, it seems to make that low end fat. The high end still feels like it's, you know, a strap. Still has that high end thing. I, I, don't, I don't think, well, the winner today for me is Belden 9778. Now, the crazy thing about the Belden is that it's like, it's it's not even considered a boutique cable. It's 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 cheap. It's like it's like a, in the I think it's around maybe 90, 90 ish cents a foot. The difficult thing is is that a lot of companies I notice now when I was looking to buy it is that they only sell it in like hundred foot or thousand foot rolls. So I haven't found a good resource. The I just bought that Belden cable raw. Uh, on eBay, about like 50 feet for $40 or something like that. But it wasn't a place that seems like they sell it continually. It was just like a kind of like a broadcast um, supply house that just had a spare uh, 50 feet. So I made like, like a 10 foot instrument cable, and then behind me, kind of over by my lamp there, I have two 20 footers. But man, those are those sound so good. I, I you know I, I I remember that I always really liked them, and I hadn't kind of had a refresher in a while. Um, so that's, it's kind of my take. It's kind of my take, but let's, uh, let's go through some of these questions. I feel like, uh, I've been a little derelict here over the last, um, however many minutes we've been doing this 45 minutes, 50 minutes I've been self-indulgent. Um, and, uh, let's see. All right. Let's see. Go through some questions. Vince, can you uh, show a video how to make custom MIDI cables? Um, well, I, I, I can, and I have on a few of our videos kind of shown the, the technique behind it. Um, but basically, the, the trick on MIDI cables is you actually don't need to get a five pin cable. You only need three pin for, or, or you, you want to get a five pin plug, a regular MIDI plug, but the cable that you terminate inside does not need to be five. Uh, pin because the outside pins on MIDI are used for phantom power, which our guitar um, oriented effects do not require. So you can get a nice twisted pair shielded cable. Um, and it doesn't even need to be very thick. You can get a lavalier uh, style uh, twisted pair shielded, which is very thin. And you would just, you know, uh, just would dedicate the shield to one of the, the pins and then the two other connectors to whatever pins you wanted. It just needs to be the middle three pins. It doesn't matter what order that solder in. And as long as you match that on the opposite side, then you're fine. Typically people use the shield in the center. So, you know, just for protocol purposes, you should maintain that. But as far as the other two conductors, it doesn't matter which pins you solder them to as long as they match on both sides and then you're good. And then you can just leave the two outside pins on the MIDI connector just unterminated. Um, no solder, no, no cables connected, you know, and if you use a twisted pair shielded or a mic cable, you won't, you won't have that option anyway. Um, let's see. Uh, just redid my own pedal board with tips from Jason. I, I mean, there could be another, there could be a guy named Jason who's doing pedal board tips, but I think maybe he means me. I don't know. Um, Oh, here is Mason. Sorry, cool. Yeah, sometimes the autocorrect will will get you on that one. Uh, Devin uh, mentioned this one. I actually don't have this one here, which is the Diodario American Stage, and that's like twenty six dollars for a ten footer. I was just uh, doing some research on Sweetwater about that. Pardon me. And uh, I used that on Robin Ford's rig actually, and it sounds really great. Uh, I think it's a great cable for the money, especially. Um, uh, <laughs> NJ Strategies, they just rolled up my rainwater sound cable. The, the, that's the one I, that's the company I was talking about in, in Georgia. They have the cheapest deal on Mogami 2524 that's pre made with silent ends. Incredible deal. Um, Lost Smoke, thank you again for that. Uh, question from Facebook I picked up an archer because of you. Should, I, should it go before or after the steel string? It should go before the steel string. Steel string, I think, sounds best after other ODs, in my opinion. Total Evo 7, my primary cable as of currently is a Pig Hog 25 foot cable. Sounds great, no issues. MIA audio cables are next on my list. I don't know those ones. MIA. Maybe that's some, some acronym I should know. Uh, although I'm not a fan of cables live. Um, got it. Well, 
I would just say use cables when you can. A wireless definitely can wreck your tone. Um, let's see. This is from Peter uh, Mayer. Mayer. Uh, my pedals are powered using a CS12, four pedals, Pitch Black, Wah, TS7, DD3, and Ditto, all using Mogami 2319. Why does the signal work when I turn on some of the pedals and I have to unplug all the stuff to make it work? I don't know if I understand this fully. Why does the signal not work when I turn on sometimes and I have to unplug stuff to make it work? Um, well, I, I don't know that it's related to the power supply in particular. Uh, so you could have a thing where you have dirty contacts, the cables could be improperly made. One thing that people really commonly make a mistake on when they're dealing with Mogami cable or a lot of uh, patch cables is they forget to remove the black conductive plastic in the interior of the cable on the center conductor. It's wrapped around that. And if that is somehow uh, at all touching any solder, uh, that can put a load on the uh, on the signal just by way of doing that so you definitely want to be careful on that and watch our uh, patch cable soldering video tutorial where we really talk about the the absolute necessity of removing that conductive plastic so that the tone is as good as it can possibly be um, so I hope that helps Peter if, if, if uh, you're still stuck you can always comment again or send me a picture of the inside of the cable and I can kind of tell you if I see anything that looks unusual uh, lost smoke uh, uh, I think there's probably more to this question later on. Um, Ian Webb, curious about how matching different brands of cable affects the overall sound using the same brand for all four cables. Well, most people seem to do that, although the real important one, if you had to spend money on one, would be that first cable like we were talking about, the one going from the guitar into the pedal board system. And then on the pedal board, I recommend Mogami 2319. If you can find a, a, a good quality, cheaper interconnection cable, um, you have my blessing, but I mean, for the money, I, I don't see how you could beat 2319. It's like under 50 cents a foot, um, and it's 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 really fantastic, you know. And, and soldered, it's 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 fantastic, you know. And and there's guys who go solderless stuff, and I get that, but you know, I don't recommend doing that if your goal is to have it work long term. Um, and there's going to be outliers like guys who go, I've used my rig and it's solderless. I've used it for 25 years, and damn it, if I'm not going to change to solder cables, there's going to be those guys. Um, but the, the real standard is, and when I say standard, it's like the overwhelming body of professionals that are doing this for a living. I can't point to one guy that is saying that solderless is in fact better than soldered. I mean, any legacy guy, anybody who has built a career on, on building rigs, I just don't see that practice uh, as a standard. Um, so back to your question though. There are guys, and I've done this in the past, that will use really low capacitance cables in the effects loop um, just to maintain the lowest possible capacitance, just knowing that there's no, uh, there's no standards on impedances um, and levels on effects loops. So a lot of guys will often use really low uh, capacitance stuff. So you know, an example of, of a cable that you might use in effects loop is like uh, one called a Getco X-Band. Um, which is a guitar coaxial cable. It's really low capacitance. Uh, also, the best Tronics ones, I think, are really good for that. Uh, and I actually ordered a few to demo myself, but I had demoed them when I was out there in Best Tronics in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. Um, so those are really great for effects loops. But, you know, all things being equal, I would say put the money in the cable that you like the sound of best going into the, inst or into the, uh, the, the system. And then you can use something that's kind of more middle of the road, Mogami 2524, uh, uh, the Canary GS6, stuff like that going on the output side of it. Uh, less important at that point, especially if you're actually using a high quality input and output buffer, which I've recommended since the beginning of time. Um, <laughs> Let's uh, see, what is the best supplier of spooled coax without ends? It, it, it is manufacturer by manufacturer different. Um, so like, you know, Mogami, most people seem to get, or at least I seem to get it from like uh, Bestronics or Redco or um, Performance Audio. Uh, for Belden, like Full Compass uh, has, has a, a good stock of Belden. Uh, 8412, which is like what Pete Cornish cables are, which are twisted pair shielded, um, or the 9778. Although I'm struggling myself to find 9778 by the foot these days, so I'm not really sure who's the best in that context. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Law Smoke says, I was told a few years ago that guitar cables should stay 10 feet or less. Well, I don't know that there's any rule, but the, the less length you can get away with, the better it will sound, presumably, because there's less capacitance in, you know, in the way. But some people want that roll-off deliberately, so that could be a thing. Uh, Sean Zimmerman. Okay, he's, I guess he's responding to somebody else. Law Smoke, thank you for the super chat. We did mention that one early, earlier there. Uh, Hendrix Maine. Is there any reason to go wireless? Well, I mean, if you need to run around the stage or something like that, I can understand in that context, but it doesn't sound better than a cabled uh, system, in my opinion. Um, any concerns with using balanced TRS for the four cable method and from the amps effects loop? Well, uh, no, you just need to wire them as I had talked about where you on the output side, you know, so the output would, the example would be output from the, the last pedal going back to the return and on the send, you would need to make sure that you would wire that twisted pair shielded, which is your balanced cable. Uh, I'm presuming that you mean like a mic cable where you have two conductors and a shield. You would just want to make sure that on the output side, you tie one of the center conductors and the shield together, solder that to the ground, you know, uh, you know, to the sleeve, and then the center conductor will go to the tip uh, on your you know, TS cable. And then on the opposite end, you'll cut away the shield and then just solder the, the center conductor that was wired to the, the, the ground on the other side to the ground, and then the tip will still uh, you know, stay to the tip. And that'll work fine. You could, you could do that and, and not have an issue. But you need to just wire it as though it's, it's a directional cable that you're making you know, out of twisted pair shielded or, or mic cable. That would be fine. Um, Vince, could you do a video on how to set up MIDI on a pedal board and how to create custom MIDI cables? We talked about this a little bit earlier and about, you know, we ha I do have a, a solution for the MIDI, uh, the MIDI Solutions Hub. The problem is, is that it won't work on every single device because technically you're, you're not supposed to passively split or parallel um, MIDI cables because of the, the current loop uh, and the way that that works. And I actually got some clarifications because I'm more of an analog guy, I'm not a MIDI expert. It's kind of a different field than what I do. And so I, you know, I had success in making it work. However, uh, most people who design MIDI products would probably not advise that you do this. Not that it would damage the, the effect, but it wouldn't work in every single context. So for example, um, I've tried using the, this MIDI splitter technique on like my Eventide H3000 or my 2290. Uh, stuff like that will not work. Um, it, it doesn't have enough current in order to make it there. But in a lot of the pedals, there's enough current left over when you parallel them that they can actually make it uh, and split it. You know, I've done it up to three ways, uh, three way splitter off of one connector. So it is possible to do. Um, all right, Death Ride 69, thank you for the super chat. <laughs> Looking good, doctor. Okay. Uh, that's a hell of a relic uh, look guitar. Yeah, this is a. Um, this is my Rory Gallagher um, custom shop Strat that I got from Chicago Music Exchange. My good buddy, Henry Bianco. Shout out to Henry. Um, and uh, he got me a great deal on that Strat when I was there. I had tried a bunch of them um, at Sweetwater. And, uh, and I tried this one at Chicago Music Exchange. It was the best of all of them that I played. So I got that one as a uh, Christmas present to myself. So a great, great instrument. Um, <laughs> as Red said, yeah. So all of you who are on Instagram, um, let me let me fire back up our, our buddies over here at, at uh, Instagram and Facebook. So all of you guys who are there who are trying to listen to the guitar, obviously you didn't hear anything because all of the my whole Pro Tools setup is all going through uh, the YouTube software. So you're not hearing anything, but the people who are watching on YouTube are actually hearing something. So definitely go there and check it out if you haven't. So again, if you're an Instagram or a Facebook person, I highly recommend you follow the link in our bio or the link in the comments that's pinned to the top so you can come and join us over on YouTube. It will be a much friendlier experience for you and it won't be frustrating because you'll be able to actually hear what's going on. Um, RJ Ronquilio, what's up RJ? Uh, can you still buy soldered red and where? Well, you can't buy soldered George L. I actually had to do it myself, which is an absolute pain. It is terrible to solder George L. cable. You almost have to like mandolin slice 
the 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 cable to, to expose the actual center conductor because it's it's full of some sort of uh, you know uh, insulator on the outside that uh, doesn't expose kind of the clear plastic center conductor. So you have to be really tricky and careful about doing it, but uh, but you can do it and it, and it will work. So um, I can show you RJ if you're really curious about doing that. I think I just bought bulk cable from um, I think I got it from Vision Guitar, which is one of our dealers here in San Jose, and uh, they, they they appear to be still shipping um, from their warehouse. So I got it from there, and then I just bought uh, the Switchcraft connectors from DigiKey, um, and I can I can link those for you if you want. Um, <laughs> only blue cable um, let's see <laughs> red also mentioned that he likes the free cables when you buy a Mexican fender I think those might be whirlwind or something like that if he's serious um, let's see has anybody made an adjustable in resistance instrument cable well, the resistance, I don't think that they do. I think that they make an adjustable capacitance uh, so you can like, uh, you can you can basically simulate a longer cable. And then there's also, a, 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 well, I guess in a way, I guess this could be resistance, uh, a resistive um, load is, uh, uh, what are they called? Radio makes what they call like a drag box or something like that. <laughs> and uh, it sounds weird, I know. Um, but basically, like, it's for people that have wirelesses and they want them to sound more like real, like, cabled, um, you know, guitars. And, uh, and so it puts, I think, some resistance on, on, the, on the line and you can, you can do that. Um, so it's cool. Uh, I'll dan in a chassis for that box. Oh, for the, the cable multi-switcher. All right, I'll, we'll draw it up. Uh, by the, Death Ride 69 is, is our uh, metal manufacturer for our pedals. So <laughs> he's a good guy. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, let's see. What do you think of Astro cables? I like them. They're kind of um, they're kind of like that Gotham cable that I talked about earlier. The ones that are Swiss made. They kind of remind me of that a little bit. I don't have one here, but I used a couple when I was at Sweetwater uh, a couple weeks back, and it was really good. I really liked it. I know that a lot of guys like those. Um, what do wireless systems do to the tone in general? Well, you know they've gotten a lot better uh, over time. But uh, usually they, they just tend to sound like a little bit flatter sounding, maybe like a little bit more anemic. And, and there's things you can do now to kind of compensate. And like I mentioned, radio makes that drag control so you can kind of get it to sound a little bit more like a real uh, instrument cable. But, you know, they're not 100%. Um, Chris Gray, thank you so much, man. That's really kind of you. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. Um, let's see. There, there's some other conversation going on between Rhett and RJ Ronquillo. Um, let's see. Um, hey, famous Dave. Hi from Cape Cod. Uh, you're going to go broke on uh, cable once uh, once I get you your 80 hiss. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. All right. TJ Nugent. Good to see you keeping on. Yeah, so a lot of this is just comments on, on the, the tone of the cables we were talking about earlier. Um, let's see. Let's see. Mason, I didn't know uh, this, but there's no sound. Okay, yeah. So this is just a reminder for everybody on Instagram and for uh, Facebook is that if you can't hear anything when I was playing guitar earlier, it's because the primary access point for all the information here is, is on YouTube. And we've linked that in the description. We've linked that uh, in the comments. So I highly recommend that you abandon ship on those platforms and come and join us here. But I'm just keeping them alive in case for any reason you're anti-YouTube uh, or you've been banned from YouTube. We don't want you to be censored completely and we're uh, giving you the opportunity to continue to engage. We did get a super chat, though, I think... Uh, from uh, Rico USA, what do you think of Transit Labs cables? Uh, I actually have never heard of Transit Lab cables, and I will check them out as soon as we're done with this this um, live stream. So I, I I will definitely check it out. Um, and if you have a, a specific one that you think I should check out, uh, tell me, and I'll uh, I'll definitely look at uh, at whatever one you say is the one to get. 
All right. Uh, another super chat, which I totally ignored. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> Again, Tim is my contract manufacturer for our metal enclosures. This is Death Ride 69. Uh, with my ears, trying to differentiate cable at EQ characteristics with uh, YouTube compression is like wine tasting with gum in your mouth. <laughs> Uh, it could be worse. It could be wine tasting after having, you know, while eating ice cream, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that listening to it with headphones would be helpful. And, and I've actually found that I've been able to, to you know, because I'm, I'm running Pro Tools through YouTube and through the CAM software. And, and I've been able to kind of EQ it where, you know, like I'll, I'll listen back to what I have that's just going directly to Pro Tools. And then I'll listen to what's on YouTube and it's pretty close. I feel like I've been able to compensate for it pretty well. So if you have headphones and you want to re-listen to this stuff and kind of go back and forth, I know that this isn't a very scientific way that we were comparing cables. I'm just sort of, you're taking my word for it in a way. Uh, but it's, it's pretty close. It's pretty close sounding. Um, I would say maybe it's a little bit more compressed, but all of those cables will all get the same treatment. So it sort of is an equalizer in a way, uh, no pun intended. Um, it, you know, it kind of levels the playing field a bit. Um, so let's go to a few more. Um, uh, I did talk about this a little earlier, so just refer back to that one, uh, Taj. Um, I love Divine Noise Cable, really high quality. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I used them at Chicago Music Exchange. We did some videos there a couple weeks back, and they, they used those, and they, I, I didn't have any complaints, but I wasn't kind of comparing them in this way. Um, Let's see. What about Vovox cables? I think they sound really good. I think they're too fragile, though. Uh, I have repaired so many Vovox cables for other people. I just kind of felt like they were just too... If you were using them in the studio, I think it'd be fine. I don't think you can travel with them, though, uh, reliably. Um, but I like how they sound. Um, let's see. This is a good question from Rodrigo. How do Amphenol plugs compare with Neutrik? Uh, favorably, but there's different types of Amphenol plugs, just like there's different Neutrik plugs. So if you get the ones that are kind of the equivalents, they're very good. Uh, Amphenol is made in uh, Australia, I think, and uh, Neutrik is made in Liechtenstein. They're both great, great plugs. I, I think if you hear, I don't see Amphenol that, that regularly. I'm, I'm not able to get them easily, so I usually just don't, don't go for them. That's Zeke trying to get in. Um, I heard John Mayer say that he looks for a quick response from an amp. Does the cable have a significant impact on that? Is the response not even significant on HQ on high quality amps? Well, I mean, I haven't seen him say this, but when I was at these rehearsals for the uh, this, this this next leg of the the search for everything tour, he was actually using one of those like road hog uh, cables, and so you know. But when when the first leg that I saw, he was he was using Mogami twenty five twenty four, and then in the rehearsals, although I don't know what actually ended up on the on the stage for um, actually there was some analysis plus too was another one that I saw on there that he had used at one one of the rehearsals or one of the sound checks because um, I went to a couple of sound checks and I went to a couple of rehearsals and so I kind of got to see but one of them yeah he was just using like one of those Roadhog um, ones you buy at Guitar Center uh, so I don't know if that was just because that was you know it, he, he was just kind of grabbing what was there or if he actually really liked that sound I'm not sure um, let's see uh, yeah, so I would say, Sean, definitely listen to it if, if you want to have um, have you know, the, the closest representation of what it sounded like. Jack, John, Mason, any tone differences in solder types? If, for all intents and purposes, no. You know, because, again, it would be you're, you're talking about such a minimal part of the whole. And so if there really is, let's just pretend we're acknowledging that silver solder is now the best sounding solder ever made then are you going to disassemble every pedal that you have and re-solder it with silver solder and solder all your, your guitar uh, inner joints with silver solder and all your amplifier stuff with silver solder? It's, it's sort of like, if it did make a difference, it's not something that, that w there's going to be enough of to make this impact, you know? 
I just say 60-40 Kester. Use that. Excuse me. Um, what do you think, think on coil cables? I think they're great if you want to attenuate highs. Just know that whatever length you have, double it. And that's really kind of the more like the actual length. Um, let's see. <laughs> Dither, so that's very that's very smooth on my tinnitus. Let's see. Pete Thorne says he likes your old wah pedal. Well, a lot most people liked it. I think that the 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 discrepancy was that they they paid too much for it. Um, so I think that there was never really an issue of people not liking it. I don't think that that was ever in contention. Um, but uh, yeah. Let's see, Brent, or Bent, Rossum. Hey, Mason, why don't you play more guitar on your live stream? You have great tone in your hands. Rock on, brother. Well, thank you. You know, I feel a little intimidated because the guys that we usually have on here are so much more proficient than I am that uh, I feel like a, like a bumbling idiot <laughs> comparatively. Um, but when I need to, I, I, can, I, can, I can pretend. You know, I can bring out my four, my four licks and sound like I know something. Um... Music therapy labs, music, or Mason at Vertex Effects is on, okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, we talked about Amphenol. Um, Daniel Wu, how do you feel about American uh, stage cable from Plant Waves? Yeah, it's really good. I actually really like it. I think for the money, it's, it's unbeatable. Um, let's see. It's a question from Instagram. Thoughts on running a vertex pedal straight into an interface? You can definitely do it. Totally do it. No problem. Uh, you know, in the steel string sounds really great. Nile sounds really great. Got another super chat here. Kingdom now. Let's see. Would you ever consider showing your followers a solder cables? I did. Uh, we have a video, probably came out about a year ago, called DIY Patch Cables. And uh, I show you exactly how to do that. And I came out with a video about a week ago or five days ago showing how to do it to your DC power cables so you can have both you know how to do your patch cables you know how to do your DC power cables and the patch cables are identical to how you would solder instrument cables the only difference is is that you would be just using different connectors a little bit more robust connector right because like I would use you know for instrument cables you're using kind of a thicker you know more robust connector like this if you're using patch cables, obviously it's going to be you know a little little less robust because those are not designed to be plugging in and out of all the time. Um, Nick Granville, glad to hear you're okay. Cheers from New Zealand. Good to hear from you. Um, let's see. First clean boost that's always on before or after a Cali 76. I'd put the set, the the compressor uh, at the beginning. I think you could. You put a compressor after that if you or sorry a boost after that if you really needed it um let's see we talked about the strat uh sergio i had a question i have my mod effects going through the effects loop of the amp for some reason i'm getting a lot of hum out would a buffer fix this well the question is 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 your modulation stuff um line level or is it compatible with whatever the level is of your effects loop because a lot of effects loops have uh, varying degrees of what they are considering line level uh, and different impedances so it could be that you're actually overdriving the input of your modulation effects um, and typically mod doesn't need to be in the effects loop I'd say more like time-based stuff reverb delay is more of a effects loop thing but you, you can use some people do use mod in there but uh, I always kind of preferred it in front of the amp, but that's, again, that's a, a, a Mason thing, not necessarily a Sergio thing. So I don't want to, you know, try to convince you that if I wear a size 12 that you should wear a size 12 shoe too. Um, so just, just a consideration, but I would say, yeah, you should check for that impedance. If you tell me what the, what the amp is, I could probably help you figure out exactly what that is. Um, let's see. Uh, Stephen Knowles, bought Mogami silent for my bass, happy with the quality, thanks for the tip. Yep, buy one and done. That's the way it is. Um, Alley Cat, why no compressor on your John Mayer board? I mean, that's not really a part of his the signature John Mayer sound, and if I really needed it, I could call it up in the HX effects. He's talking about 
Actually, I took that board out to my workshop, so I don't have it here to show you. But, um, yeah. From Facebook, love the ultraponics. Great, thank you. I love it too. <laughs> uh, how are you sleeping these days? Pretty good. I always sleep well. Never have a problem with that. I don't require a lot of sleep, though, either. I only sleep like maybe six or seven hours. Um, but, um, yeah, no problem. How about you? Um, if you wanted to match a bass guitar tone and volume close to my others, uh, I would just suggest a, 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 a transparent boost. Uh, and everybody says their boost is transparent, but very few of them actually are. An easy way to tell is to turn it to unity gain, bring it in and out, and see how much of a difference there is. I highly recommend our Vertex Boost for that purpose, but uh, again, uh, you, you know, you could say I'm biased, <laughs> um, heavily biased. Um, let's see, from Instagram, from Eric uh, Marvey, what are your thoughts on using DIs on a guitar rig? Well, I mean, it just depends on whether you, you want to go direct. I don't think it's going to sound as good as a tube amp, but sometimes people don't have the, uh, the ability to be able to use that or they need to go direct. Um, if you do, you just want to make sure you have good kind of pedals that can kind of emulate a more 2B sort of preamp. Um, Rico USA Transit Lab cable model that I purchased were the DPA models. Okay, I'll, I will check those guys out uh, when we're done with this stream because I'm, I'm curious about this. Um, not trying to start a rumor, just a serious question. Is it true that John Mayer is in critical condition due to the coronavirus? I saw it mentioned online, but I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know him very well personally where I would be a guy, a guy that could ask him that. Uh, or check in with him on that. Um, but uh, I'm more closer to, to people in his camp um, and, and in his band. But, uh, yeah, I haven't heard this. If that's true, it's terrible. Um, I hope he, hope he recovers you know, fine if he, if he is. Um, let's see. Do you find that there are a lot of issues, this is Dan in New Jersey, do you find there's a lot of issues with Hot Rod Deluxe on the effects loop? Well, it's not like the best loop ever, but it's workable um, if you need to use an effects loop. But most of the time, you, you only would need to use it if you were using the distortion channel on it, and almost nobody does that. So there's not really a whole benefit of using the effects loop at that point unless you're using the, the gain channel of the Hot Rod Deluxe. So otherwise, you don't have much of a need to use it. Um, Kingdom Now, uh, yeah, take a look for that video. I think you'll you'll dig it. It looks like Mejia actually just posted it here. Um, Jose, hey Mason, I watch you and Rhett Scholl regularly and have been trying to find a video where you made the three to one MIDI cable. Uh, I will, I have a diagram up on our site right now, but I think I kind of buried the link, you know, so it's not searchable because I needed to learn a little bit more about the MIDI side of things because there are conditions where this cable will not work. For most pedals, it's fine. And it's not like a thing where it would damage your pedals, but there are conditions where when you parallel the, the MIDI cable or you, or you put it in series, um, it can just have, a, it just won't work, you know? So I kind of wanted to learn a little bit more. Basically the bottom line, the finding was when I talked to a real MIDI expert that just does MIDI stuff all day long, is that it's it's really a current thing, and the only reason why it's working on you know splitting to three Strymons, for example, is that it allows it, there's enough current left over by the time it makes it to those pedals uh, that uh, that it's able to still provide the the MIDI transmission. But you know when I try to do it to my rack gear, like my Eventide harmonizer or my uh, you know TC Electronic stuff, it doesn't work on those. And so I was trying to figure out why that was, and so. I, I will I will share it uh, soon, but it will have a lot of uh, notation on there showing that it is not going to work in every single scenario. And I'm sure that there's probably scenarios that I haven't tested yet where it won't work. But again, it won't damage anything. It just won't send the MIDI signal. So you'll know at that point. So you might want to test it first before you actually do a hard install on the rig. I just got lucky that I did it a few times and it never had a problem. So I continue to do it. And I still haven't had a problem until I went to try it with using rack gear instead of um, some pedal-based stuff. But maybe there is a pedal out there that this won't work for. I don't know. Um, what is the Jewel guy's last name that you had playing through one of your... Oh, Jules. Jules Leahy. 
Um, SH, by the way, heard back from Goodwood Audio that their interfacer has a 1 meg input and a 500 ohm output. So that's pretty high uh, output. And I don't know if they have a dual buffer or not. So you want to clarify that. The other thing is, is that uh, somebody had brought one here in the meantime and they had a transformer in it. And the transformer that was in it didn't spec out for the output impedance of the buffer. So in other words, when you have a stereo setup and you need to use a out or a, a isolation transformer, I think I might have said output transformer, I mean isolation transformer. When you have an isolation transformer, there's typically a specification of the type of impedance that the, the isolation transformer wants to see so that it actually acts in accordance with what um, with with how it's going to operate best. All these guys use like Jensen transformers and stuff like that. And I, and, and, I, and I really, really want everybody to hear this who's listening, who has been told that they need a Jensen isolation transformer, that it, it is fundamentally incorrect. And even the designer of all the transformers, Bill Whitlock, has said that they don't even make a transformer that's as low grade as the type of audio signals that we're running for guitar stuff. So they don't even have a transformer that's optimized for our purposes. But because tra Jensen Transformers is such a big name, people like to use them. That's a aside. So the transformer that's in that Goodwood one, I looked at the data sheet on it, and the output impedance of the buffer is, is not low enough to even drive that transformer. So there's going to be color on the side where the transformer is being used, so on the right side, let's say, output. It's going to get some color because that transformer is not getting the impedance that it's designed for. Uh, and I would suspect that 500K or 500 ohm, sorry, is too high because normally we would want something, you know, really stable that would be something like 80 to 150 ohms. So this is about five times higher than that on the output impedance. So, you know, again, that's why I'm telling people there's, there's almost no high quality buffers that are commercially out there. Just, I think even some of the designers don't know what the mark is. I, I don't think that they know what I don't think that they know what they're trying to hit. And and uh, or or they have a really specific sound that they like, and they like that it doesn't have fidelity, or they like that it's not a hundred percent representative. And that could be true. They could just say, hey, you know what, I really like with a little bit of roll off. I like it to be a little bit inefficient. That, and that could be their thing. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's a conscious choice or whether it's an unconscious choice. I can only speak for, for myself and the stuff that we're gonna be putting out, you know, it's, it's gonna have transformers that match up properly. And, you know, and if you wanna try some of this stuff yourself, I can tell you a good a transformer to use and it's, it's not, you don't need a Jensen to have a high quality isolation one. In fact, the one that I really like is, is made by a company called Triad. I think they're like $5, you know, because people forget that, you know, it, it, if, if the speed limit is 60 miles an hour and you have a car that goes 250 miles an hour, it's like you can't you can't even use it for for that purpose. You know, it's like it can't, it can't work. And I would say the Jensen transformer is it's not just in that scenario. It's also like on top of that, it's like not even designed for that type of signal. Um, you know, so it's it's just like it's just not the right the right fit. The name brand is great. You know, it's like you know people use a Jensen because they want to just like you want to say you want a Ferrari, you know, or something like that. But it's it's not the right fit for this application. Um, so I really just want to stress that to people. Um, Denny, do you know Cordial Cables? I don't. I don't know them. I'll check them out too. Uh, are you familiar with the LR Bags DI? Uh, I have my effects running through the effects loop. I'm not sure if I need a buffer. It probably has some sort of buffer in there, I would imagine. Um, also, wireless, sure, at the front. Well, the wireless is gonna is an input buffer. You would, you'd you probably still maybe need an output buffer, but you could probably check. I bet the LR Bags has a, a specs showing what the output impedance is. Um, so I, I would presume that that's probably buffered in some way. Um, bent. I like the use of the vertex boost with the volume pedal and RJ's ring. Can you explain how that works? Yeah. So basically, uh, RJ talked about it slightly incorrectly, in that you can't you can't eliminate the signal from the volume pedal if it's going to remain analog. And some people do what they call a voltage controlled amplifier, VCA or VGA to use an expression pedal for something like this, but those color the tone quite a bit. 
So it was better for us to do that with gain stages. So essentially what it's doing is anything that's plugged into that expression loop, whether it's an expression pedal or a, pedal or a volume pedal, it is isolating the impedance of whatever's in there. So in other words, it doesn't matter what's in there. That impedance is irrelevant. It's still going to function as a normal volume pedal at that point, no matter what. And then you can use the boost on top of that. So if the boost is off, the volume pedal functions as normally. It just doesn't have any tone suck because the impedance is isolated through the boost. The volume pedal plugs into the boost or the expression pedal plugs into the boost, which is controlling the overall volume. When you hit the boost and you've set it, let's say, to 8 dB, which is about noon on the boost, now your volume pedal can express up to 8 dB of, gain, of output, you know, of boost, when it's in the toe down position and will still calibrate all the way back to silent in the heel position. So basically it's like you have two different preset levels of boost and you can control all that shades of output with the expression pedal or the volume pedal, whatever you want to hook it up to, it will be compatible with either. So let me know if that is not uh, clear and I can, I can go further. Uh, Gabriel from Brazil, how do I get one of your risers? These are going to be available in uh, April, so just stay on our, uh, if you sign up to our newsletter, you will be notified as soon as they are available. Um, this is from Instagram. Does the Boss ES5 color your tone? How do you compare it against the Mastermind and Morningstar products? Uh, I think the ES5 is the best for the budget. You know, if you just need an inexpensive, it's great for that. Um, the Mastermind is a better unit. It's it's the Rolls Royce. I think that and the and the um, Musicom Lab are the the two best in my opinion of all the switchers that are out there. Uh, the Morningstar is great. You'd have to get a separate MIDI switcher for that. Um, and, but there's no buffering going on in there, so you'd have to do all your signal conditioning externally to that. But if you just kind of need a bare bones baseline, it's really great. And that's what I'm using on my uh, HXFX rig. Um, ben, uh, Rossum, is the production versa, Vertex Boost the same, or was it, it was it a custom feature? All of the Vertex boosts are the same. They've been the same since 2013 when it came out. Um, do you ever use a spectrum analyzer to check uh, isolation transformers for stereo? I don't. I don't. I usually, you know, rely on the spec sheets, and then, you know, if if there is a if there is an issue, I do have one uh, engineer that sometimes I will contract to if there's like if there is a problem that I'm hearing something that that's weird, and I'll have them kind of track down bugs. For, for stuff like that, if we were going to go into production, we use something like a transformer. Um, but um, no, I, I, I don't. I typically look at what what are the output impedances of our buffers, and then are we going to, uh, is the spec sheet of the, the uh, transformer in alignment with that? And then sometimes we will, you know, give it a listen, see if we notice anything. Sometimes people won't use spectrum analyzers uh, for this stuff depending on whether they think their ears are good enough and that they can see things on a scope that maybe they can't hear um, which is which is true in some cases for the the um, the triad one one of the engineers that we use for like our PC board design had used those a lot and he had already done kind of all the legwork and that's part of the reason why we why we started using them when we need to use isolation transformers so he did that I didn't do that and, uh, and he kind of did the legwork for us on that one. But we knew that as long as we hit a certain uh, output impedance on the buffer that, that we would be able to use that transformer. And, uh, and on a lot of the higher end transformers, stuff like uh, you know Jensen's and stuff like that, even though I'm not recommending them for this purpose, they have data sheets that really show all of the possible uh, information that you would want to know in terms of you know, what the transformer can handle, impedances, and all that stuff. Um, Let's see. Will Vertex Effects release a channel buffer module? I don't know what a channel buffer module is. Um, this is from uh, Instagram. If I put a Boss WL60 at the beginning of the board after the in and out interface, will the wireless still work? At the beginning of the board after. No, you would want to go into the interface after the wireless. So you go to the wireless and then you go into your input buffer go through everything, then use the output buffer. So you'd, you'd, you you would just plug in the buffer first. So, I mean, you wouldn't need that input buffer, but it's not going to hurt anything and certainly will, could make it maybe improve the tone a little bit more. Um, hey, guys, I just donated $3. <laughs> uh, 
to know how things are going these days. I got a good answer to a good question. Anybody else care to join me? Anybody else want to match the donation I just made? Well, that's that's kind of you. Um, hopefully, I answered your question well. But you know the 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 these days, I think that you know things are obviously a little bit different for everybody. We're pretty fortunate in that our contract manufacturer, pardon me, again sponsored loosely by Lacroix. Our contract manufacturer uh, does a lot of military contracts. And so as a result of that, they are still staying open, at least in partial capacity. So, you know, it's it's created some shipping delays for us just because they don't have their full staff there. Um, and so stuff takes a couple days longer than it would normally. But one thing that we've done on our website in order to really help our dealers is we're not selling direct at, at this time and all we're doing is pushing people to dealer Amazon pages, dealer reverb pages, or just generalized dealer pages that you can find based on your zip code. Because we, you know, we just delivered a ton of inventory to dealers, um, you know, about a, a couple of days before all of the shelter in place stuff really happened. And so a lot of our dealers have a lot of inventory and we really want to incentivize people to go out and buy stuff from them. And, you know, it's if you have the means or the resources right now, it's a great time to buy from a lot of these dealers because they're offering huge incentives, free shipping, you know, expedited, uh, you know, no tax in some cases, lots of bundling. Bundling is just like they'll combine other products with it. So they'll give you, you know, some patch cables and some guitar cleaner and contact cleaner and stuff like that. So I, I highly uh, recommend that if you're in the market to buy a, a pedal, whether it's one from us or one from somebody else, uh, but you actually check in with that uh, individual manufacturer to see what what's the way that's going to work best for them to to um, to maximize their their profitability during this time. For us, you know, we you know we have reserves and and you know I've I've, I've planned for stuff like this. You know, obviously depending on how long it goes, that 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 may change. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm really encouraging people at this time to really, if they want to buy one of our products, to go to our website, find one of our dealers, or go to Reverb, or go to Amazon. I've got direct links to uh, everybody that's selling this stuff, and you can you know figure out the one that's best for you. But if you're considering buying from another gear manufacturer, I highly recommend just getting in touch with them and maybe just asking them, like, hey, you know, I really want to support your company. I'm really interested in the pe this pedal. What's the best way for me to get it, um, You know, given that we're in this kind of historic moment in time? <laughs> Uh, but I also understand at the same time that many of us don't have resources to go and do that. And, uh, and that's why I want to do these videos. I want to give you some, you know, all the tips that I can, as much DIY stuff that I can with stuff that you already have laying at home, you know, like the power cable video that we did last week. Um, I just want to show you how you can take exactly what you have and be able to, you know, if you need to buy materials, it's, it's, you know, cents, not dollars, you know, like those little DC plugs are, you know, what, I think there's something like 19 cents each or something like that or 25 cents each. So keeping it really low and really allowing you to make those improvements as cheaply as possible. So, you know, my, my goal during this time is, is really just to, to give you as much information, as much DIY tutorials as possible so that you can use this downtime to make improvements for your rig and, and really not have to spend any money, you know, if at all possible. So that's, that's where I am right now with, uh, with all of this stuff. Um, Let's see, Carrie Miller, what is your choice for a smaller low profile splitter box to two amps? Uh, I got, I like this one. I have the uh, Lely P split, and it's got a uh, polarity and a ground control on it. So this is a good one. You just need to make sure you have like just some sort of semi buffered signal going into it. It says it can take higher low. Uh, impedance signals, but I think it's just a good idea to get as low going into it as possible, but that's the one I use. Um, Matt M. Just got the Victory V4 Countess, and it's bitchin', uh, but it has some serious ground loop hum, which is probably due to the sh the bad electronics. Uh, what's a way to solve this? Any... Uh, okay. So, in, does it do this when it's on its own? You know, so like you have nothing plugged in except that, just guitar in and then into that. Is there, is there any issue? You know, is, is there any problem with that? So that's the, that's the first thing. Uh, and if that's able to quiet it, you know, I, and I don't know exactly which one this is, is the, is the, let me, let me just look it up. The Countess V4. Sorry, I'm not really familiar with their stuff. Countess 
v4 victory. Um, okay, yeah, so it looks like it's a pedal. Um, let's see. Victory amps. I'm reading up on it. Doing my, doing my quick read up. Countess. 500 bucks. All right. So, um, yeah, I guess it just looks like it's running on DC. Uh, it's crazy that it's got tubes in it. I wonder how it's even getting, really even needs tubes at 12 volts. Um, yeah, it looks like there's some, some interesting ways to connect it here on the back. Um, I would say try it by itself first. Let me know if that changes anything. If you're still finding it noisy, so because it has preamp tubes in there, there could be you know noise issues with the preamp tubes. And when you say ground loop, um, you know describe that because sometimes people will call hum the 60 cycle hum a ground loop, but that's a different thing. Um, so just cl help me help clarify that. And if you know if I sign off before you get a chance to respond, just just throw that in the comments and we'll we'll get to that. Um, James, what's the best way to stack a tube screen with a transparent overdrive? Any I try to use, I either get extreme noise or nasty clipping. Um, well, anything that's going into your tube screamer is going to saturate it more, right? So usually I would say the higher gain thing should be closer to the guitar. The lower gain thing should be further away from the guitar. Because if you boost into an already driven pedal, it's just going to distort it more. It's not going to add more output, right? It's not going to give you more level. Um, so, you know, if you had something like, say, let's see, do I have a tube screamer here? Uh, all right, I have, I don't have a tube screamer, but I got a Max, or I got a Nobles ODR1. So, let's pretend that this is my more distorted pedal, ODR1. So, my guitar is going, where's the input? My guitar is going into this, and then I have this other pedal, JHS Morning Glory. It's kind of my lower gain thing. I think you would do better going after. So we have, you know, guitars on uh, guitars over here, goes into this, then this goes into this. This is lower gain. This is higher gain. So if this is higher gain, right, and I had to reverse these and I boosted this, it's just going to distort this thing more. That's not going to give it more clarity. But if I put this after and this is lower gain, this is going to boost the output level and it's also going to impart its EQ. So I usually like doing, putting the higher gain stuff closer to the guitar, right? Because you don't have much need if you're going to stack it to overdrive it more. It's already got a ton of gain. You're just going to want to kind of boost that gain and get it out in front more. Color it a little bit. Um, so that's what I say. Uh, ben, have you ever thought about doing a video about... Uh, your company, how you got into what you did. Uh, I haven't thought about it, but it's it's a good idea. I feel like it would be hard because, uh, it would be hard for me because, you know, <laughs> I would be the one dictating the narrative at this point. Um, you know, whereas if, if somebody came to me and they said, oh, I want to tell your story, you know, I would agree to it. But I, for me to be the one that's driving the, the train of the narrative, I don't know. I, I feel like it would feel weird to me to be the determining what were the what were the what was going to be kept and what wasn't. Um, what mixer do you like for wet dry wet setup? Uh, I like the this parallel mixer here, which is uh, from Old Blood to Noise Endeavors. I like it because you can bypass the parallel loops if you want. Uh, the other one I like is the Exotic X Blender or the Stereo X Blender. All of them are great. Um, in fact, I would have used an X, a stereo X blender if I had had one, but I just had the regular X blender, uh, which doesn't have enough loops for what I was doing. Uh, how, why would you use the polarity inverter on the Empress stereo buffer? So when you're using a stereo amp setup, your amps may not have the same polarity. So the way that you would test this is you just hit like a low E, bum, 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 and then you flip the polarity and you'll notice one of those positions, the bass like goes away. So you want to get it in the position where you, f you feel all the bass. That's how you would test that. Um, hey Mason, I purchased an Earthquake or Swiss things about two months ago, and I can't stop finding new ways to get creative with it. Uh, I don't have any experience using it. I just measured the impedance because somebody had asked about uh, buffers. 
Uh, any Zapata news or chats coming up? No, but I'll, I'll check in with him and ask him if he's interested. He's got some time on his hands, I think, now. Uh, Mario Arnold, I recently purchased the Empress Buffer Plus, which is 510 output impedance. I noticed this when I plug my guitar into the buffer, no other pedals. I get a swoosh noise. Well, if you're not plugging in any other pedals, then it's just like an open loop at that point. So you would, you ideally would at the very least need to bridge the send to the return, or you just have to go out of the send directly into an amp. Um... So, you know, it would be like if you didn't connect your pedals fully, if I'm understanding how you're connecting it here. So I think on the Empress Plus, the, the output impedance has nothing to do with that. Um, you know, the output impedance on that is a little higher than what I would recommend, but it's still good. I, I, I realized later that the stereo um, buffer has a different output impedance than the mono buffer. Um, the mono one is a little higher uh, than, than kind of the recommended range. It's not terrible. But it's it's a little higher than what I recommend. But what you're saying it has nothing to do with that. Um, I think it's just because you didn't fully connect it, and so it's just like having an open loop at that point. Um, buddy, my Univibe always distorts even when I'm playing clean. It's at the end of the chain. Well, uh, it's it's distorting because the input in, the the input signal is being saturated. I recommend putting univibes before distortion if you don't want that distortion to occur. So you would put it, you know, closer to the guitar instead of after the drives. So give that a try and see what you think, because um, I think that that's, I think that's usually how how most of those cats are running, like Hendrix and stuff like that. Um, so we've done an hour and forty five minutes. It's gotten pretty crazy. Talked about cables. Talked about all kinds of stuff. One other thing I'll talk about for next time. I, I was thinking about talking about AC cables. We've talked about all the different types of cables. We need to start talking about AC cables. So maybe for next time, we'll talk about these guys um, and why you shouldn't spend any big money on AC cables because even if it's the best one in the world, you still got a thousand feet from your wall all the way out to the main line and your street. So it's like you, you buy like a terrible, you know, steak that's just absolute garbage and then you pour a little organic salt on the top and then you, you're calling it organic. Um, total waste. But this is my favorite one for durability purposes, which and it's pretty thick. It's actually a medical IEC connector or IEC uh, cable. And it's like, it's like 15 bucks, man. And it's long. It's like 20 feet. Now, I always had all these problems with pedal boards on stage where I had to like always run into power strips for my IEC cables and this one's so long it can really go anywhere so we'll talk a little bit more about that later this week um last two mr mikey v uh ts10 clones modern builds out there you recommend i mean just get a ts10 a japanese one it's probably less money um i know a lot of people like the uh, jhs bonsai for that um sergio thinking of buying a steel string mxr timmy and a distortion for a jhs what order uh i would say uh I'd say the PG whatever, 14, then the Timmy steel string after all of them. So I'd go highest gain to lowest gain. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, re, I don't know what a Behringer is. Well, most most jacks are plastic. These, these jacks are plastic. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. If you're using, I mean, you could always just replace it with equal stuff. I mean, Neutrik jacks are good. Using a decent quality alpha makes good uh, foot switches. You could use something like that. Um, ground matters on AC cables. Well, you should have a ground on them. Um, but I think that that's probably par for the course. If, if, if you have an IAC cable without a ground, you're in trouble. Um, I'll link it. I don't remember the brand, but it's this medical company and uh, I found them on Amazon actually. And I bought like a bunch of like five different types and this one was incredible. Um, and so it's, it's good stuff. Um, so thanks guys. Thank you for all of, uh, all of you who are on Instagram, all of you who are on Facebook, uh, for hanging in there. And, uh, remember if you want to have the fullest experience, come join us on YouTube. It's the best place to watch it. I can 
bring in audio, I have a full Pro Tools rig that's set up to this, so it'll sound better, look better, and it won't just seem like I'm pulling questions out of thin air. Um, so thank you to all, and if you have any more questions, just put them in the, in the, uh, in the comments section. Please make sure that you subscribe if you haven't already, and a lot of you have subscribed but haven't selected the all on the notifications. And so if you don't do that, you're only going to get about 25% notifications of all the videos that we put out, whether that's you know content videos, DIY stuff, or whether it's live streams like this. It'll just be the best way um, for you to be able to get all the latest and greatest stuff. I'm going to try to do this as many times a week as I can, so uh, we will talk to you. Next time, thank you folks on YouTube. I'm going to say goodbye to my friends on uh, Instagram. And I'm going to say goodbye to my friends on, I already said YouTube, but I'm doing the YouTube last. See you guys.